Hello and welcome to Living Truth, a media ministry of the People's Church. Wherever you're tuning in from, we're thrilled that you have decided to join us for our time of worship as we grow in God's Word together. Today, Pastor Charles takes us through the first book of Romans in verses 1 through 6. Join us as he unpacks what it means to not be your own as followers of Christ. We hope that you are challenged and blessed by today's teaching. If you got your Bible with you, we're going to read from Romans chapter 1. I'm going to read the first six verses of Romans chapter 1 this morning. And that will be our springboard for what I want to talk about. Romans 1, verse 1, Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle and set apart for the gospel of God. The gospel he promised beforehand through his prophets and the Holy Scriptures regarding his son, who, as to his human nature, was a descendant of David, and who, through the spirit of holiness, was declared with power to be the Son of God by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Through him and for his name's sake, we receive grace and apostleship to call people from among all the Gentiles to the obedience that comes from faith. And you also are among those who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. That's as far as I'm going to read, and if I were to ask you the question, how do you define a Christian, I wonder what your answer would be. I think many of us would probably start with, uh, a Christian is a follower of Christ, or a Christ follower. But that term is never used after Pentecost. They're never called followers of Christ after that. The best word is the word they did get called. It's the word Christian, which means Christ in people. They were given that as a nickname in Antioch in Syria. But now we're not just Jesus out there, I'm back here. We're united with Christ, in union with Christ. We abide in him, he abides in us. The relationship is totally different. But what is the nature of that relationship? There are different aspects to that. But I want to talk about a key aspect that Paul talks about in this verse, Romans 1, verse 1, where he says, Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle. He describes himself as a servant of Christ Jesus. Seven times he uses that phrase about himself, and the Greek word translated servant is the word doulos. Now, what Paul is saying in the opening of this letter is, I want you to know I'm a bond slave of Jesus Christ. I'm a doulos of Jesus Christ. I have given myself up to the will of Jesus Christ. Now, there's a difference between a servant and a slave. And the difference is not just one of degree, you know, a servant gets paid at the end of the week and a slave doesn't. The difference is much more fundamental than that. A servant has a master, checks in on Monday morning and checks out on Friday afternoon, but a slave has an owner. And this is the term of the relationship you and I have been brought into with Jesus Christ. In 1 Corinthians 6, verse 19, Paul says, Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, he says, honor God with your body. Don't you know? He says, don't you know your body is the dwelling place of the Holy Spirit? He lives in you. Don't you know that, he says? And don't you know that as a result, you are actually not your own anymore? Don't you know you were purchased 
on the cross by the blood of Jesus Christ outright. You're not your own. These are the terms, he says, of the relationship into which you have entered. Now, in Romans 1, verse 6, which you read earlier, he says, and you also are among those who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. Not just called to believe in Jesus Christ, but to belong. And the Christian life works out from that relationship. And it's a lifelong working out, but it works out from that relationship. Now, we are bond slaves. We are servants. If we're taking the Christian life seriously, we've brought ourselves under the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ. We are bond servants, but we don't feel like them. And so, Jesus, I won't call you one because this relationship is a love relationship, and I'll call you my friend. How does this work out? How does being a bond slave of Jesus Christ work out? And I want to give you three things that the master does for the doulos, for the slave. There are three things that God does for you when we submit our lives wholly over to him. The first thing is that the master plans the program of the servant. Going back to Romans 1, Paul writes, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle. Called by whom? Well, my life has been handed over to Jesus Christ and bought with a price. I'm a bond slave of Jesus Christ. And therefore, as a bond slave of Jesus Christ, I have a divine call from heaven to be something on earth. I've been called to be an apostle. Now, of course, that was uniquely Paul's. He goes on to say, set apart for the gospel of God. But the confidence he has is as a bond slave of Jesus Christ, I am called to be something. What that is will differ from person to person, of course. There's some here this morning, and maybe you're called by Jesus Christ to be a teacher, or maybe to be a gardener, or to be a mother, one of the noblest callings or to be an accountant, or to be a lawyer, or to be a doctor, or to be an Uber driver, or to be a musician, or whatever, it doesn't matter what. The point is that the doulos, the bond slave of Jesus Christ, doesn't have an agenda of their own. They're saying, well, what is it you want me to do? What is it you want me to do? All his interests, all his activities are tied up with the interests and the activities of the master. And when you meet a man like Paul, you meet a a man or a woman who is a bond slave of Jesus Christ. When you find out what they are interested in, you'll know something of what God is interested in. Because the interests are connected and tied up. Now... How do we know this working out in our relationship with God? How do we know what his mind is and his will is? I think a key verse is in Proverbs 3 and verse 6, where it says there, in all your ways acknowledge God, and he will direct your paths. Acknowledging him means you relate every situation to him, And you keep doing that, you acknowledge him in all your ways, you relate every situation to him in a disposition of dependence, and he will direct your paths. That's his job, that's his prerogative, he will guide your paths. Do you know something? We're never told in scripture ever to pray for guidance. Do you know why? We don't need to. It's part of the package. In all your ways acknowledge him, 
He will direct your path. Now, we have to make decisions, of course, and we're told to pray for wisdom. Several times. If you lack wisdom, ask God who gives it to you. So we ask him for wisdom, but he has promised as part, if, if I may use the expression, the package of the Christian life, when Jesus Christ comes to live in you, one of the things he comes to do in you is to direct our paths. Now, of course, we can resist him. We can grieve him. We can stand back and say, I've got my own agenda here. Or we can say, Lord, what is it you want me to do? He'll direct, but how, how do you know what he wants you to do? Let me give you another key verse. And I haven't time to talk about this in any detail this morning. I'm just giving you the headline, if you like, this morning. Although, I'm going to be speaking in five weeks' time, I think it is, on 23rd of April. So after this morning and a bit of discussion with some folks, I think I'll come back and flesh this out a bit next time about how do we know uh, the will of God. But let me give you this verse. I'm, don't hold me to that. I'm just thinking that in the last hour. I might have forgotten it by tomorrow and have something else in five weeks that sits on my heart. But here's an important verse that's meant a lot to me. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Delight yourself in the Lord, he'll give you the desires of your heart. Psalm 37, verse 4. There's a wrong way to read that verse. There's a right way to read that verse. The wrong way is, delight yourself in the Lord, and he'll give you everything you want. That's the wrong way to read it. Here's the right way. Delight yourself in the Lord, and the desires of your heart will be God-given desires. He will place desires into your heart and you can trust him for that because that's what he's promised to do. We often see the guidance of God better in retrospect than we do in prospect. And don't worry about going wrong, by the way, because there's another great verse in Isaiah 30, verse 21. If you turn to the right or to the left, your ears will hear a voice behind you saying, this is the way walk in, walk in it. He's not in front saying, come on, lift your foot up, swing it forward, that's it, put it down, get your balance right now on the other foot, that's it, come on, come on. No, just go, he'll let you go, and if you go wrong, he'll say, oh, hey, hey, come back, come back. You make it clear. Come back and put you on track. Because he's not like a robot where God's in heaven. And we're kind of down here, it just happens. I mean, there is no perfect will of God. And I, I, I'm saying that, I'm saying that with considerable thought. Because again and again in scripture, God works within the fallen realities of our situation. When the Israelites came into Canaan after they were freed from their slavery in Egypt and Joshua led them in, you remember. When Joshua died, God set up Israel as a theocracy, which meant God ruled. Well, what does that mean? It meant that he set apart men, they, or women, they called them judges. And there were men and women. He put his spirit on them. People recognized God was with them. And they rattled behind them. And this went on for 400 years. But God raised up judges here and the judge there. They weren't inherited. They just were different folks, usually not connected. The Spirit of God would identify and pick one out. But the people got fed up with this and they wanted a king. They wanted, they said, to be like other nations around them. And Samuel, who was the last judge, said to God, God, they're rejecting me and they're rejecting everything I'm telling them. And God said, no, no, they're not rejecting you. They're rejecting me. But, said God, I'll give them a king. And I'll tell you who it is. He identified Saul. And Saul became king. The Spirit of God came on him. He began well. He ended badly. And towards the end, when he was ending badly, God said to Samuel, I'm going to find a man after my own heart to replace him. And he appointed David, and David became king of Israel instead. And you know, when the New Testament opens, it says a record of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David. There shouldn't have been a David. He shouldn't have been king. Except that the people rebelled, and God said, all right, we'll go with it. We're not going to mess with it, and we'll just we'll make it work. And again and again, God does that. 
And so if you, if you mess up, it's not the end of the world. God, in the image of Jeremiah 18, talks about a potter. and the, He's talking about the sovereignty of God, and the clay gets, gets damaged on the wheel. And the potter remakes it into something else. And God said to Jeremiah, can I not remake you? And the people of Israel, can I not remake you? You've gone off track. We're not going to have the perfect what I intended, but I'm going to remake you into something good, not second best. Good, make it good. That's the teaching that is there. But there are some important checks and balances about God's guidance. It will always be consistent with his word. It'll be true to you. It'll be consistent with his word. That's why if you're wondering about running a casino, probably not. I think his word has something to say about that kind of thing. It'll be consistent with his character. You'll exhibit love, not greed, gentleness, patience, kindness. It'll be true to your personality. Always be yourself. Don't try to be something else that you're not. It'll probably energize you because gifts, whether natural or spiritual, usually energize, energize us. I, I, I have no, not much time for filling out forms and checking boxes to find your spiritual gifts. What energizes you is the question. That's where you're gifted. So the master plans the program. I won't say more about that. But I'll tell you this, you can trust him. You can trust him. Second thing, the master provides the resources. Because everything the master plans for his servant, he provides the resources for them. I mean, a servant, especially a slave, a bond slave, doesn't have to provide his own resources for his master's purposes. There was a time in the book of Exodus, chapter 6, where the masters didn't provide the resources. The slave drivers in Egypt told the people to make bricks of clay and did not provide the straw that they needed to strengthen and hold the clay together. And it calls it, in Exodus 6, verse 9, cruel bondage. But this is submission to a kind master. Because remember, although you're a bond slave, you don't feel like one, you feel like a friend. And everything to which God calls us, he provides the resources. Somebody said to me when I was young, never ask as your first question, is something possible? Ask, is it right? If you ask, is something possible? You live in the realm of the possible, which is where everybody on the street lives. If you ask, is it right? It may not seem possible, but do it. There's some things, of course, which are possible, but are not right. There's some things which are right, which don't seem possible. But you step out in obedience, knowing that he who calls you is faithful, he will do it. He'll bring it to pass. He'll make it happen. And you remember that time that uh, in Matthew 14, when the, Jesus sent the disciples across the Lake of Galilee one night, and he stayed back on the shore, and he knew something they didn't know. He knew the weather forecast, and a great storm blew up, and the disciples were in this boat, some of them seasoned fishermen. But Galilee, as you know, is below sea level, and the gales come down from the Golan Heights and swirl around. There's nowhere for the wind to go, and storms on Galilee could be more difficult than storms on the Mediterranean Sea. And these disciples were in a storm. Another time, they're in a storm, and Jesus was asleep, and he says, the waves came over the boat that time. That was some storm, where you hold a net up the way you, to, to, you usually do to catch butterflies, and you catch fish as the, as the wave comes over the boat. Well, they're out in this storm. And they're in the boat, terrified. And they see what they thought was a ghost, which made it even worse. And then as they got closer, they realized this was not a ghost. This was Jesus walking on the water. When the waves went up, he went up. When the waves came down, he came down. And there they are, waiting for a wave to swamp their boat. And Peter worked something out. The very thing threatened to be over my head is underneath his feet. So he said, bid me come and join you on the water. Well, we know Peter was impulsive. He said things without thinking about them. Bid me come and join you on the water. And then Jesus said, come. <laughs> I'm not sure I meant that. <laughs> no, 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 no. It doesn't say this. I'm paraphrasing because we know Peter. 
Come, Peter, come, come. No, no, no. Uh, come, put your foot out. Go on, into the water, on the water. Oh, Peter. Okay, now the other foot. Okay, I'll hold on to the boat. <laughs> come. And he began to walk. And then it says he saw the wind and he became afraid and he began to sink. When it says he saw the wind, it doesn't mean he said, oh, there's a wind blowing. No, he'd been noticing that all night. He took his attention from Jesus, stopped trusting Jesus, and looked at the wind. When he looked at the wind and the problem, he became afraid. Keep your eyes fixed on Jesus. And you see, Peter, you come. Everything he tells us to do, he provides the resources too. But it's impossible. It doesn't matter. I said, come. I know, but you can't walk on water. Come. But it's impossible. Come. It'll be a miracle. Come. Okay. Woo. Until he looked at the problem again. He provides, and I'll tell you this, the master plans the program, the master provides the resources, and you can trust him. That's his job. It's his promise. And thirdly, the master protects the purpose. What I mean by that is this. Man may have one servant over here, and he says, do this. Another one over there, do that. Another back here, do that. They don't know how each of their tasks interact with each other's to accomplish a big picture. The master has the big picture. I know what I'm doing. As we're told in Romans 8.28, we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him who have been called according to his purpose. That's a great verse. Not the, the old translation, the King James says, all things work together for good. Things don't work. Things are not active. Things are passive. It's in all things, God works for good. God's the subject of that sentence. God works for good. That even when things seem to go wrong, he knows what he's doing, and he will work out the end purpose. And he's constantly adjusting the things in our lives. There are broken things. There are things that stay broken. But we trust in them. God works for a good end. We not, may not know what that is in this life. That's why he doesn't call us bond slaves. He calls us friends. We are bond slaves. We don't feel like one. We feel loved. We feel he's our friend. I love my master. I don't want to go free. I want to give everything I am and have to him. And as the last verse I'll give you says in Matthew 16, verse 25, whoever wants to save his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life for me will find it. That's not an invitation to martyrdom. That's saying, if you want to hang on to your life for yourself, Go ahead. But ultimately you lose it in its significance and purpose. But if you will give your life away to me, you will find it. Because when we give our life away to Jesus Christ, he gives his life away to us. We say, I love my master. I don't want to go free. He says, you're not my slave. You're my friend. And I'm going to live in you and work through you to bring about my purposes. I wonder where you are this morning in this. If you're just following, you'll be very frustrated with that. It doesn't work. But if you're in union with Christ, you abide in him, intentionally placing your dependence on him, acknowledge him in all your ways, delight yourself in the Lord, you'll discover he will direct your path, you'll discover he will give you the desires of your heart. He will give you those desires. He will lead you. He will guide you. He will plan the program. He will provide the resources. He will protect the purpose. And you can trust him for that. You can trust him. Because that's what being a real Christian is. A bond slave of Jesus Christ called to be something and living 
in the riches of his presence within to enable that to be fulfilled. Amen. Come on, let's sing the truth of who God says that we are today. Sing, who am I? Who am I that the highest king would welcome me? I was lost, but he brought me in his love for me. Oh, his love for me. Come on, sing it out. Who the sun sets free, who oh, is free. Together in this place, let's declare this truth over ourselves that I am chosen, not forsaken. Sing it with me. I am chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am. Cause you are for me, not against me. I am who you say I am. I'm chosen. I am chosen, not forsaken. great reminder from God's Word today. If you are feeling led to support or learn more about our ministry, visit us online at livingtruth.ca. You can also call the number on your screen to make a donation. Thanks for joining us today. We're looking forward to worshiping with you again next Sunday.